It's a documentary that talks about the Italian occupation of Ethiopia um, with us. The co-sponsors of the evening and also the co-producers of the film are our friends of the Centro Primo Levi that I welcome here, their board members, Tella Levi, and their directors, uh, Natalia Andrimi and Alessandro Cassin. It's, it's a fundamentally important uh, moment in Italian history that has been removed for so many years uh, under the myth of Italians did things in a different way, Italiani brava gente, uh, a myth that has been only partly dismantled by historical research, uh, but very few people read history books. So I wish that in the future, uh, when you ask somebody, have you read that book, Italiani brava gente? People might say, no, I've not read the book, but I've seen the film. <laughs> uh, and they refer to this film that really helps understand through a micro case of history, that is the, uh, a monument that all of a sudden becomes hijacked and from being dedicated to the um, death uh, people who died in war, mysteriously becomes dedicated to Maresciallo Graziani that was responsible for many of the atrocities committed by, committed by the Italians in Ethiopia. Uh, so starting from that specific micro historical event, that it seems about to be settled. I think with Valerio we were talking that tomorrow we expect uh, a court to pronounce a sentence uh, against the mayor of Affile, uh, the, the city where the monument was erected. So it's a great example, example of how from micro history, the history of this monument in a small town near Rome, a hijacked monument again, you can come up with the reflection on one of the most disgraceful moments in Italian history, that is the um, colonial adventure in Ethiopia. I thank all of you for being here tonight, especially those of you who are seated on the floor, and I hope you can still enjoy the film. We have the fortune of having here with us uh, tonight uh, the director, the producer of the film, and also two experts, two colleagues that I will present uh, before the panel begins, uh, Ruth Benguiat and Mata Mengiste. So please stay with us also uh, after the end of the film and enjoy it. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, our speaker to take their place on the stage. And uh, yes, there you go. As I mentioned, to discuss with uh, the director of the film, Valerio Ciriaci, and the producer, Isaac Lipsing, we have uh, two very important guests uh, that were together in a very interesting enterprise in this very room last year. They organized for the first time a two-day symposium where voice was given to uh, the occupation of Ethiopia seen from the side of the Ethiopians. That is very often a story not told and not heard. And they invited scholars and artists and visual artists and musicians. And it was a fantastic experience for them and for us and for the historians that you invited to share together that part of history seen from an angle that has always been neglected. So thank you both very much for what you did. And I just want to remind those of you who are interested that you will find the uh, video with the complete recordings of, those, of this symposium on the website of Casa Italiana. And uh, <coughs> our speakers are uh, Ruth ben -Giet. Ruth is a professor of history and Italian studies here at New York University. Uh, she was the chair of the Department of Italian until two years ago. And her last book, I, I will just mention that, Ruth, is Italian Empire Cinema. Uh, for the first time ever, Ruth tackled a mass of Italian films made during the fascist empire. Uh, many films that nobody had ever seen before in contemporary times, after they were released at that time. So it was a, an incredible work of digging and mining, and uh, in a very impressive work also of contextualizing these films uh, in the light of other uh, colonial films, imperial films from Britain, France, and other, and other parts of Europe. 
And so I think her presence here is particularly uh, helpful for us uh, tonight. Uh, Mata Mengiste is also taught at NYU, not right now, but she, she did, and we hope she will come back. And uh, she's a novelist, essayist, and photographer. Her first novel, Beneath the Lion's Gaze, was selected by The Guardian as one of the 10 best contemporary African books and named one of the best books of 2010 by Christ Christian Science Monitor. Her second and upcoming novel, The Shadow of King, is forthcoming, and we hope to present it here. Thank you, Matza. And please welcome our, our speakers. And again, Valerio Ciriaci and Isaac Lipsing. Thank you. Um, is this on? Okay, good. So I'm just going to um, make a few points with my historian's hat on, and then um, I have so many questions for the filmmakers about this uh, wonderful film, um, brave film, timely film. And Maza will speak as well, and then we'll have some responses and questions. So. Um, you saw the Italian official Zingaretti said that uh, Graziani has been, you know, con judged by history. But if, if we learn anything from this film, and we learn many things, is that, you know, there, there is no one history. Um, you see the divided histories, that memories that people have. Um, so I, when I was watching it, I, I had kind of a few categories of history that we see in this very complex um, film. I'm just full of admiration for how you've woven it all together. So on the one hand, we have histories that kind of happened as the documents tell us, right? So we have the voice of Italian history, the progressive history, uh, in the figure of Mauro Canali, who a very good scholar who we see in the archives. And um, I have to write him and tell him I'm very jealous that he was able to be in the archives like that because I've never been able to go in down, down there, right? <laughs> Um, usually they just bring them to you and you're only allowed three per day and it's just uh, always frustrating. So I was agog with all of this. But, so you have him. Then you also have the Ethiopian director of the Global Alliance for Justice who is studying Ethiopian war crimes, right? And you have the British historian who's lived in um, Addis for many years, uh, Ian Campbell. So these are kind of the the people who are studying the documents. And then we have history some people wish had happened, and here we go into the realm of fantasy, because this film is about fantasy as much as it is about memory and history. And here, I guess we could side to the mayor of Afile, um, who really uh, has his own uh, version of reality uh, going on, um, and he can't believe that the Italians used gas in Ethiopia, and so he refers to the um, judgment of this guy, Indro Montanelli, who, who famously refused to, uh, d told Italians uh, up till, you know, up till the state practically had to admit in 1996 that gas was used. He had a column in a very popular newspaper, and he would tell people writing in that no gas was used. So this is the authority that the mayor, um, so this is a kind of whole category of people who, who, who are in a wishful thinking. And then we have histories some people wish happened to them. Um, and here we have Giuseppe, the person who, the agronomist who works for FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. And he's such an interesting, we, we, we go crazy over him and not in the positive way either. Um, you know, he, he lives immersed in this past that seems to be more meaningful, perhaps, than the past today. And of course, you know, this film's also about heroes. And this guy, clearly, you know, do we need heroes? Uh, and Graziani, to some, is a hero. So, you know, his Ethiopian girlfriend who, you know, maybe she gets tired of standing in for an entire people. Um, and she says, you know, what's done is done. But it's really a living history for him. And, and this film, I, I want to, you know, you talk about perhaps, because the, all of these histories are just, they're very they're still living, they're still vibrant, they still evoke anger, they, as they should. But um, it's, it's the film, you know, anyone who thinks history is past has to see this film. Um, and we can contrast him with Nicola, the Italian-American who is, you know, advocating for truth. So he kind of speaks for histories that, you know, some wish never happened to anyone. The tragedy, the terrible tragedy of, of the Italian occupation. 
And then, of course, the other category, the voice is a personal recollection. And the film does a, f is, this is a film about testimony. And it's so, it's so um, brave um, in, in, in its evocation of testimony by, by Ethiopians and also by Italians, people who either lived it themselves or their families were personally affected. Um, so last is, you know, perhaps Mulu. And I wanted to ask you guys about, um, I'm obsessed with sound at the moment, sound in cinema, sound everywhere. So I was very struck by the way you handled the sound in the film. And her voice is the first that we hear and the last that we hear, right? And I think it's very significant that you, you made this choice. Um, and in, as you've seen, her, her voice is layered over um, shots of Italy. You know, a file, a little town, and then Rome, and and it's very, it's almost like it's jarring. We're not supposed to hear an Ethiopian voice in this little perfect hill town, right? Or these Italian monuments, and it's like her voice is like a specter that maybe some Italians would prefer never to see, so they can go on believing what they'd like to believe in the past. Um, but she's there, and it's very strong that the film ends with her saying she's going to come back to fight as long as that monument is there. So, you know, of course, I want to ask you about the title, If Only I Were That Warrior, but, you know, she is, she is the warrior, um, and, and, you know, we need to have heroes like her, too. So mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ruth. It's really, um, it's really wonderful to see so many people here to see this film, um, which is just fantastic. I, uh, I had a chance to see parts of it months ago, um, briefly, and I was uh, really taken aback by the, the care and I think the, the, <coughs> the precision that uh, the filmmakers wanted to put into this film and making sure that this was balanced and uh, this portrayed all the different sides of this, um, of this war. I, I come to this history with, uh, with, from a family connection, from because I am Ethiopian, because I remember my grandfather talking about this war, and I know that his brother died in that war. Um, and from my father's side, there were many of his brothers that were killed in this, and some who were no more than boys, who might have been 14 or 15 at the time. Um, and so I come to this history with a lot of emotion, and it gets very hard for me not to be angry when I see this um, or when I think of it. My new book um, that's, that is almost done now is set in this period, in this war. So if you can imagine the day, my days now and the level of passion and anger that I sometimes have, um, it, it's, it's very real. It doesn't feel like this history has gone away. Um, I think what's very interesting for me to see in here, I find Giuseppe, he's a very, um, he's a problematic figure in this. He's one of the more complicated figures here. And I think it's very easy for us to point our fingers and, and everyone can talk about Graziani but fewer of us can really point to the Giuseppes and our families and begin to really deconstruct and confront those people. Um, and I find that the conversations um, that Giuseppe had in the living room with the other gentlemen in Ethiopia when they were talking about uh, the fact that you know, Ethiopians, um, they've kind of forgotten about this. This is 70 years ago. And in a sense, it's, um, you know, we can talk about Italy having a kind of amnesia about this war, but we also have to talk about the fact that Ethiopia had its own kind of amnesia with this war as well. That when Haile Selassie came back into power in 1941, one of the first things that he said was that um, there are Italians here and you, you will treat them 
we will treat them as brothers. You know, we understand the Mussolini did something, but we will forgive and we will, we will move on. And what that did is seem to place um, a kind of lid on the, on the levels of conversation, the kinds of conversations that could happen in Ethiopia about this. And I think that what we see, which is really fantastic, is that this young woman that Giuseppe is with, mirrors what happens to a generation when all you hear about are the heroes and you don't talk enough about the people who were the survivors or the victims of that war. Um, and just one last thing, I think, is that um, when we had this conference here a couple of years ago, which was really enlightening, I think, for, for all of us involved, and we had Ethiopian scholars come here, um, one of the things that seemed to become more and more apparent, and I'm putting this out there for all the Abusha, is that this war has often been told from only one side, um, and only one kind of voice in Ethiopia. So I wonder, what are those stories that we haven't heard even in our own country? How would this film change if the, if the camera was held by an Ethiopian, if it was held by someone from a different ethnic group? you know, from various ethnic groups or various religious groups, how would this story become even more complicated? So that's for the artists and the writers and everyone out there. I have it. No. Uh, first of all, thank all of you for coming here. And thanks, Ruth and Maza, for the very the beautiful presentation and critique of the film. And uh, now I will start saying that this is uh, it's, it's important we are like screening uh, this film today, also because tomorrow uh, is a, is another important day uh, regarding the monument. Uh, tomorrow there's gonna be the sentence for a trial, the trial that see uh, uh, the mayor of Afile accused of uh, apology to fascism. So right after. The, uh, the monument, uh, all the scandal, uh, AMPI, then uh, you see in the film, the, the organization of the Italian partisans, they uh, like filed a suit uh, to, the, to the mayor of Afile. And in September there was the first trial, and uh, tomorrow they're gonna read the sentence. So this is a very, is very important because from there, uh, it will depend the future of the monument. Because the monument is still there. It's true that Zingaretti, as Mulu say, uh, blocked the funds, but it's still it's still there. And like Mulu, a lot of the Ethiopian, uh, a lot of Ethiopian communities around the world are still very like are, are fighting against this monument. Uh, they have been tomorrow. They're gonna be a sit-in, uh, like a, some sort of protest in front of the uh, of the tribunal. So. So this this battle is still still going on, but unfortunately we needed to f to finish the film in order to to screen it. But otherwise we would have like keep filming like forever because as you know in Italy things takes forever, <laughs> uh, and it's like that. So and no, it's it's good that you were talking about like Mulu and you you were saying that maybe she's the warrior. And nobody really told me this before. They were probably seeing Giuseppe as the warrior in the title. Somebody see Graziani, but I think I really like the fact that I don't know this is confusing a little bit. They can this warrior can apply to 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 different characters, and it's kind of. It reflects you no know, the kind of uh, this kind of uh, guilty amnesia that we have. You know, what if I was the warrior and that I never been? And uh, so that was the the choice of the title. That is uh, the first line of the first canto of Aida. And unfortunately, we couldn't explain much more in the film. But I think I like the fact that it's a little bit. You know, people ask question, and it's something that you know you come back home thinking about it. And so, as you introduced better than me, uh, this is not. Uh, didn't I didn't want to do like an historic film only, so it was more kind of a film about history and how kind of memory works. And was like shocked me was seeing when we start working in this film, uh, seeing how like does memory uh, change depending on who you ask. And I myself came with little, little knowledge of this period, like because in Italy we, I don't know, it's something that I did all the high school and 
And it's something that is just like it's a small chapter in the in a history book. We don't know about all those massacres. Uh, maybe if you go to university and if you read the Boca books and uh, the book of many historians, you get to know the story, but there is very little knowledge about this. So it was a way for me also to kind of like, I, I'm not a historic, uh, historian, so it, I started with a question and uh, the question was, how, how is it possible that you can honor, honor a fascist monument, uh, a fascist war criminal in 2012? So th this was basically our way to answer that question. And actually, I, I would like to add something on that. I was just in Italy last week, and I happened to have a conversation with a high school history teacher um, at a party. We were talking about the film. She was interested in it, and she said, oh, wow, actually, um, I was just teaching the Italo-Ethiopian War yesterday in class. And she said, yeah, I spent 20, 20 minutes on the, entire, on the entire episode of the thing. So I think that really goes to show. I hadn't even told you that yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing this. Yeah. So, so this um, this trial that's uh, ending tomorrow is really important. We tried to look into whether there had ever been a uh, conviction for uh, apology for fascism in the history of the Italian Republic, and apparently there hasn't been, at least not one that we could find. Um, so the law is clearly very seldom applied, and if uh, conviction is handed down, it will be a historic um, a historic event, because monuments such as these, there there have been many other instances of similar things happening in Italy that have basically been swept under the carpet or that people have never even heard of. So the fact that this monument is getting a lot of attention and the fact that there is a trial, regardless of the outcome, is, is pretty important, I think. Um, one of the, I, when I was, I, I kept thinking how much this is um, a, a post-colonial film in, in, in the best sense of that word. And one of the things I found myself doing was making a little, um, map of the places that it took place. And I really like that it didn't take place only in Italy and Ethiopia, but also among the Italian and the Ethiopian diaspora. And, and it was in the States, let's say, but there are others. Because, and one of the reasons I like that is, you know, you had multiple points of view. And, and when, we, when we become immigrants or exiles, our, our views of the country we left and that its, its history can, can take on a certain form that's very different than the people who are still there, right? Um, but also because the Ethiopian War was this global event. You know, there, were, there was a march of 25,000 African American men in Harlem. Um, there were protests and street battles in Buenos Aires between, you know, leftists and, and, and rightists of Italian origin. And, and I think that you respect that by looking, including the diaspora, uh, in that. So I, I really, I thought it was fantastic. Um. Maybe just um, a, a little bit more of, about what you were talking about, what was happening in New York. Um, during, in 1935 and, and 36, as this war is going on, if you, um, if you look up certain, um, certain old n newsletters and newspapers, I believe like Amsterdam News was one of them, um, and I, I can't remember the others, but you'll continually see, I, I was looking um, not long ago in, these, in the police reports that they would print in the news, and you would see so-and-so um, from Harlem went to Brooklyn and got in a fist fight with so-and-so, and it was about this war. Or the fact that the police captured, you know, didn't capture, but picked up a 14-year-old boy um, uh, several blocks from his house and said, where are you going? And he had coins in his pocket and he said, I'm going to give this money to Haile Selassie. You know, so it's the, um, there's, there's a reporter, Herbert Matthews, that was um, writing for the New York Times and was stationed embedded with the Italian army at that time. And he has, um, in his diaries, he talks about meeting, um, meeting with Italian soldiers in Masawa and also in Asmara and coming across um, Italian-American soldiers who had, um, they were fighting on the side of Italy. So um, we're not too far away, like Nicola's history, 
being here and, and our own history as Americans <coughs> here, it's not very far away from, from what was happening there. Uh, do you want to respond and then maybe we could take some questions? Quickly, I think it was, uh, it was also like, an, I mean, he, I, I live here in New York, so that was easy, but I think it was, it can be very natural, the fact too, that, that we include uh, the, the Italian and Ethiopian diaspora. Actually, the film, like the idea of the, the film took shape uh, here in New York when I, I went to Calandra Institute and uh, Primo Levi, Centro Primo Levi organized this event, this panel, I don't know if you were there, but there were, like, I met, many people and uh, I met one of the characters there so everything like started here and um, actually this character it's here Nicola can you stand up one second yeah and uh, so yeah, I mean that that's where where it started, and it was a kind of out of necessity because uh, the main protest against the monument uh, started here in New York City and in America. There is this this organization called, called the Global Alliance for Justice, and we interview Kitane in Texas, Dallas, and uh, he's he was basically the, the brain behind this big big protest that took place. Like we went to Washington, but every year, February 19. Well, this is an, as an important day. It's Martyr's Day for, for Ethiopian people. It's the anniversary of the massacre of Addis Ababa. Well, Ethiopians commemorate this event, and they also talk about the Graziani Monument, uh, talk about what happened. They're, they're very aware and uh, very active. So that was interesting. But I mean, it's true and uh, that he has this international impact, the, the Ethiopian war, the Italian-Ethiopian war. It was also the first wars to be documented like uh, severely with uh, with cameras with uh, photographs, and it's now it's a paradox that we know very little about it, right? So that was. Uh, and, uh, yes. Okay, I would say yeah. Let's let's take some questions, and if anybody has a question for Nicola De Marco as well, um, feel free to ask them. <laughs> No, I, I just I wanted to say that perhaps it would be interesting, perhaps Ruth can give us uh, a little um, background on this. I mean, this was international, an international event because Ethiopia was part of the League of Nations and the occupation was uh, in violation of the agreements and um, somehow both the League of Nations and the, the democratic countries did not intervene against uh, uh, the abuse from to, uh, from totalitarian countries like Italy in this case. So that, of course, I think was the reason of uh, the, the, the international uh, weight. And this country ended up having a certain, you know, uh, impact on the, on the final outcome. I mean, I think Ruf, as an historian, can explain this uh, this much better, but I mean, the, the the failure of the of the international league was, I mean, that was the beginning of uh, the, the Second World War. I would say because that's it was like the no, uh, it was the demonstration that that this league couldn't work, didn't work, and uh, I mean the Americans also didn't intervene at the time. They were like good relationship with Mussolini, and uh, they, it happened that they. Uh, I mean, I mean e even if the war the invasion kind of ended the good relations, but in yet uh, in common interest in uh, in oil and other matters uh, prevailed, and that's I think something that is an is an is an important uh, uh, reflection for today. We have two questions here. That gentleman. Well, it's a note. I want to make a comment. I don't think the monument is a unique phenomenon. We've heard, I've read in the newspaper that some mayors, fascists, 
were un proposed as mayors of cities in Italy. So I think this is, might be a trend and a dangerous one. But I also want to comment that waging war in Ethiopia, invading Ethiopia, I read, uh, made it easier for people or for the fascists to sell anti-Semitism because racism is racism and that is also made it more acceptable. So that, that it shows how dangerous the colonialism is and how you regard the people that you try to colonize. But um, I felt that the Signore in the Biblioteca, in the archival library, I felt he was sort of trying to pacify or, or smooth over the situation and justifying the fact that, oh well, this is Italy and we have fascism and this is fascist and this is how it, we can't lock up the whole country. But I think we really have to go deeper than that and try to understand what happened in history to, so that the fascists were able to have so much power. Uh, in fact, wherever the ex-partisans worked, they were, uh, they were attacked. They were th thrown out of their jobs. The, corpor the, the, the corporate leaders and the fascists had a kind of unity amongst themselves and they really made it very, very hard on these partisans who even the allies admitted without them they may not, m might not have been able to win the war. Thank you. We'll pass to the next question. Thank you. Um, my name is Negash, I'm an Ethiopian. Um, I, for me the question it raised is, first of all I really want to congratulate you, are very well done films. Cinematography is excellent. Uh, sound is very good. Just a lot of the historical archives you dug up. The thing I want to reflect on is race, the question of race. The Italian campaign in Ethiopia was about race. They just, although it was a colonial campaign, it was about European civilization. It was about superior, superiority of the Italian race and what they were bringing to Africa and the rest of Europe was willing to look the other way. The other part of this is that where race comes in is how this issue was resolved. This was an African Holocaust. European Holocaust was brought up in Nuremberg. This became a little footnote. The African, the killing of uh, over half a million Ethiopians it became a little footnote, uh, maybe a few people read here and there. And I think that's an important part for me as somebody who's lived in this country and has looked at these issues. It's not thought in the schools, it's not brought up. It's not just about this little place in, 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 uh, in Italy, about this town, about this statue, but I think it's how history is presented, how people are judged, uh, whose pain is valued more than others? Why are some Holocausts are talked about and others are not? And thank you for bringing this up. I hope it would be a lead to these kind of discussions, to these kind of issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you very much for, for doing this movie. And uh, as an anti-fascist and anti-mafia person, I, I really thank you so much. And uh, there's something I think historically you didn't point out. It was important, and it goes well with the other points the other friends here made it. In 20, 22nd March 1938, Italy, Mussolini, up, up, you know, did the, the racial races. And don't forget, I think the gentleman was right, don't forget, not only they, they forget about the gay people, the anti-fascist, tortured and killed, and anyone else who had a black skin or was gypsy, including us, there were Southern Italians. And uh, first of all, I want to say I'm sorry, maybe uh, uh, you don't know Italy very well, but Italy was just started to be an Italian state based on, fa on false historical uh, fact. In fact, being Sicilian, we were invaded by the Italians. 
Well, our, our kingdom lasted 900 years, just to tell you what is Italy is like. 900 years, one, we were one country. After 900 years, in, in 100, 150 years, they un, uh, completely annulled our history, our culture, and then we became what we are. So as a Sicilian, and it's my opinion, my humble uh, opinion, we were the first colony of Italians. Thank okay? you. And that, no, 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 I want to finish. So why do you forget There's that no thing? We need why do you forget the fact that the, the, to be a different race was be, uh, also the secret was that the Pope himself said Mussolini was the right man for, the, for that time. Thank so you why very the Italian much, forget? We need Thank to you. pass to the next question. Thank you, sir. I don't think I can get up. <laughs> no, don't worry. Anyway, uh, if you want to actually know why the fascists were able to come back, by the way, there's a very good book called, uh, it's about Carlo Tresca, who was a uh, communist, uh, well, a, a labor agitator during the 20s and 30s, very powerful man. Uh, who was shot by uh, one of uh, the mafia uh, as because of Generoso Pope, who was a fascist at that time, but he was here in the United States. But back to my point. If you want to know why the fascists were able to be excused, if you want, the Italian fascists, uh, if you want to use that term, they were pardoned, or uh, there was no retribution, because the Americans had an interest in defeating communism after World War II. Okay. So what happened? Sir, thank you. Um, we have this very well, special opportunity to have the filmmakers present, and I would like to have some questions for the quest, filmmakers. Yeah. It's very rare to have filmmakers. Well, my, I have a... Please. Questions? There's a young woman over here okay. in the front. Yeah. A question? I saw a hand back there, but a question? And uh, the gentleman back here. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. It was a great film. Um, I just wanted to ask, what were some of the challenges you found interviewing in Ethiopia? You know, and how were, how were their reactions? What were their responses? If you had any responses? Um, yeah, just some of the challenges you had filming in Ethiopia? Yeah, I mean, many challenges. <laughs> many challenges, yeah, the language was definitely the, the first uh, barrier, the first big obstacle. And uh, I mean, there are like people, uh, most of the time we call, it speak, we call it speak English, so that, that helped, but other times we needed to use an interpreter there. And I think we went very lucky uh, on, in Debre Libanos when we interviewed the, the monk, there was um, there was an interpreter, Ethiopia Ethiopian interpreter that was that lived in Italy many years, so that was uh, like unexpected. That really really helped us a lot. So this was one of the thing. Um, I mean, not a, I mean, they all, and it's difficult to go in a country that you you don't know. It's a completely different culture, and uh, so there is also I know a way to understand the, the logistical part, you know, organizing how you move, how you move around. Uh, in this, like Giuseppe kind of helped us, especially in this in this northern region. Like he drove us all around with this jeep and we went <laughs> like, and he was like, yeah, no, he was actually like waking up us uh, at 6 a.m. in the morning, even 5 a.m. and brought us like climbing this mountain and me and Isaac running back <laughs> with this camera. Like it will, it will, like it was really unstoppable. Um, like couldn't get tired because he get very excited when he when he talks about that. He really, really, really wish to have lived in the area. And no, uh, uh, no, not yet. I think no. I'm a little bit scared to show it. Here. No, but um, I mean he might like it. I, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. It's, he loved the. He saw the picture of him looking on. In front of that Adam, he loved that. But it's true, like the comment you made, and it's true. He's a very controversial character, and I think we realized this uh, after the first screening in Italy, and uh, we were getting like many comments. But 
people were like shocked by Giuseppe and they, they really got upset about him and they have like all kind of questions and and they were not shocked by by the mayor they have no comments about the mayor because the mayor is this kind of like picturesque character or something that okay he's a fascist you know he thinks that way but they were really moved by him because I don't know they and I like that you say that we have a Giuseppe probably Giuseppe is, is in our family because I think it kind of like mirror uh, some sort of like Italian uh, awareness, uh, no? And uh, yeah, but the other side also, when we show it to Ethiopian, Sara, his girlfriend, is kind of another controversial character. And uh, so we have, uh, we have in Italy people say, you should take out Giuseppe, you shouldn't show it. Like, why you put that guy? It's a joke, it's Alberto Sordi. Like, come on, it's, you can't do that. And uh, we have on the other side also Ethiopian that didn't want to see uh, Sara at all. They really couldn't like send her. But it, it, Giuseppe is so he's so important also because um, there are you know he he's part of a kind of a humanitarian assistance. He works for FAO, and there are you know for there are divided uh, opinions on on that kind of aid which there are legions of people working very hard and sacrificing their lives for this kind of work and then some people see a neo-colonial agenda especially in the inception of these uh, agencies so he's he's really important because he has both there he's full of goodwill he's helping these people grow things and, and avoid famine and then he he's caught up in this history and just I'd like to say one thing is it's always shocking to me to remember the Italians only occupied Ethiopia for uh, from 1930 they went in in 1935 and they were defeated in 1941 now that's not a very long time and yet it was such a dense time and so so violent, um, and that it it evokes what we see today. Um, and you think of Eritrea was you know decades, Libya was decades, and th things happened there too. There are equally bloody, violent histories, but Somalia exactly. But this is a it's a condensation um, of of co colonialism, actually, uh, in, for many things. Um, do we have time for a, a few more questions, Stefano? One, one more? OK. Well, I was very impressed by uh, the movie. You started the movie with uh, uh, a few uh, views of uh, Eur, the uh, neighborhood in uh, Rome that was planned uh, for the um, Universal Exposition on 1942, but it was never completed because of the war. And actually it was completed after fascism, it was completed by the Republic. Uh, so in the movie there is also a description of uh, buildings in many ways. You have also the tomb of uh, Mussolini himself. Of course the monument is the key, uh, I would say, character in, in the movie. And um, interestingly, uh, there is also a, a, a big debate on restitutions, and there is just one reference to that in the movie, uh, when uh, Mulu, uh, I think, spo uh, talks about uh, cultural, or maybe the, uh, the, direct, see, yeah, the director of the center. Now, that is my question. Uh, the government of Ethiopia uh, fought heavily in order to have back the obelisk of Aksum, which was actually uh, in front of uh, the current uh, headquarters of the FAO, which were built as the Ministry of Colonies of Africa, as you know, in uh, Rome. And in this movie, what is lacking is the point of view of the government of Ethiopia. You had the point of view of Zingaretti, who is a politician, different uh, views from diasporas, as it has been uh, rightly said, you have different Italians, the uh, Italian uh, who lived uh, in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, with whom uh, Giuseppe talks, is a guy I know, actually. Uh, I think he is, is one of those uh, second generation Italians in, in Addis Ababa. So you have the official, the, the politicians in Afile. You don't have any official from the government. So. How do you explain that, and uh, what thanks. could I have added to the movie? Ah, it's, it's true. Thanks. Thank you for the question. And 
the the Ethiopian government uh, is is lacking is because it's lacking from the whole kind of um, situation here. It's like he refused uh, kind of to, to talk publicly uh, against this monument, and he actually there was I don't know, the situation now in Ethiopia, as you probably know, is not that of a very democratic uh, government. Actually, the opposite is a uh, is a dictatorship. Almost, no, I mean they have a, a f kind of fake parliament, and they win every election for 99 percent. And uh, when they there was like a group of Ethiopians uh, protested against the monument to Graziani, it was the opposition party, the Blue Party. They went in front of the Italian embassy and made like a very pacific protest. The Ethiopian government sent military and arrest everybody, and people spent like weeks uh, or a week, like days, days in jail. So it's like they have been um, like refusing. Probably I don't know. Maybe f there is some political. See, I'll give you. Uh, I don't know a relationship that they don't want an economic relationship, but they are. Yeah, they're they're lacking from from that. As as you were saying, the the Ethiopian government really doesn't has no interest in um, in publicizing this controversy because relationship, the relations between uh, Italy and Ethiopia today are actually quite good and there's a lot of uh, economic interest in common and the Ethiopian, gover uh, Ethiopian government really had no desire to antagonize the Italians in any way. And the Ethiopian government is also not very enthusiastic about promoting uh, discussion about that historical period, generally speaking, because it um, it's part of a whole conversation about uh, Haile Selassie and um, maybe Maza can speak a little more about that, but why the Ethiopian government doesn't love to talk about the Italian occupation so much. Anything you'd like to add? No, I think you said it. <laughs> <laughs> so are we out of time or? Question for Nicola. Nicola, you want to come up to the stage? Uh, Thank you very much. Um, deeply appreciate it. I'm deeply honored to be here. I don't want to take too much time. I see a lot of you want to leave. But um, with the respect to the Ethiopian government, I'll forward to the director and producer the document that we have where the Ethiopian government formally told the Italian government they are deeply offended by this monument. It was done at a, a UN conference, and we have the written statements. I don't want to defend the Italian, the Ethiopian government in this circumstance or as a generality. Um, and just to say that relations between Ethiopia and Italy today are as good as they ever have been. And um, that's one positive thing uh, to say about that without saying great things about the Ethiopian government per se. Um, okay, I'll leave it at that, and please. I will just uh, maybe take a second to thank uh, Centro Primo Levi that have been very supportive of us from the beginning and co-produced the film with us. And uh, we have the editor, Giovanni Pompetti, that is here. Great, a great job. Three months in editing. And the sound, you say you like the sound, there is the sound designer here, you can talk with him maybe later. Luigi Porto. Thanks again for coming and... Okay. There was a question that was left lingering, I think, from the lady back here, regarding the question of the race, and also I believe it answers the question, why is the Centro Primo Levi involved with a film about Ethiopia? And I wanted to show you this cover of La Difesa della Razza, of August 1938, and the question was if the colonial enterprise was in any way connected with the racist policies uh, pursued by the fascist regime, and of course it was. And you see here very clearly in the photograph, uh, this is 1938, it's right at the time when the racial laws came out, that there is a Roman sword that divides the beautiful, noble Roman head of a statue from a bronze representation of a stereotypical Jew and of an African uh, person. So it, it's very interesting to see that the root of colonialism and racism was exactly the same. 
and it couldn't be portrayed more effectively than in this cover of one of the most despicable magazines ever published in Italy. <laughs> and thank you again, Valerio and Isaac. And thank Ivani you. And all of you.